Um, yeah, I'm Charles. So this is going to be kind of informal in a formal kind of informal way. Um, I uh, have been teaching here about 35 years, and one thing I really like is questions. Even uh, we'll have a question afterwards, but if you see something up here you're interested in asking me about on the fly, I would love that. So help yourself. I'm supposed to screen share here if I can remember how to do this. Mm -hmm. Sort of buried at the bottom, I think. Uh -huh. And so if, if we uh, only did, even though it was billed tonight, that this is Denali through Collodian, which it will be and is and out there in the hall. I brought a bunch of prints because, you know, you'll see them up here nice and big, but I think looking at a print lets you really look at an image and see some of the finer parts of it. And there's a plate out there and the 8x10 view camera. So you're welcome to play with all that stuff after the show, after the tonight's thing, and uh, pick up the plate. I don't mind. That's one that I'm not going to do much with after this. There's a print right beside it, and you'll see how they're all made as we go here. So I'm going to sort of take you through my life in photography, starting a long time ago, and how I got to Collodion, which is somewhere in this twisted tail. So this is, let me get a little clicker out somewhere. I put Where to put it? Here it is. And that's me. So, Denali through Collodion. That's in the park shooting one of the pictures. But first, the early years. So, when I was 10 years old, my father went to Japan and came back with a camera from my sister and one for me. It was a little Minolta 16 PS. And we picked him up at Washington National Airport and we had to drive across town to the hotel. And I got this box that had the camera in it, right? And you open up the box, the camera was in there, a roll of film, an instruction book. And I know looking at me now, polished in Savoy like I am, I actually was kind of a nerd when I was a kid. Not now, but back then. So we uh, were driving across DC. I remember this so well, you know, some things stick in your head and other things you forget. But driving across DC and I opened the box, I'm excited because I've been wanting a camera for a while. and and. Uh, get the camera out, get the instruction book, take the roll of film, unwrap everything, try to figure it out. It was a little drop-in cassette, like 110 film, about that size. Drop it in the camera, and I'm looking around now. You know, it's loaded, I wind it up, and what can I shoot a picture of? We're driving by the Washington Monument. So that literally is the first picture I ever made. I actually kind of like the picture. I wish I could have made a lot more like it that cool over the years. But they are more like this, you know, <laughs> for quite a while. Um, there's that Washington Monument. That's Smokey the Bear. We went to the zoo in D.C. That's my father. He's an engineer. He's a nerd, too, um, in the front yard with his eyeglass case. And then the rocket. I took this slide out, but as I was uh, preparing this talk tonight, I was sitting on my couch looking across the living room at that rocket. I still have it. I built it in 1969. It's a five-foot-tall model rocket for Saturn V, and, you know, I was a nerd. So um, I never was this organized after this, but this is... Summer of 70, I wrote this on little index cards back then, what pictures I'd taken on that roll of film. So there's Washington Monument from Carr. <laughs> and um, there's a photographer named Lee Friedlander who did a whole book of America by Carr. So I'm going to send this and say, you stole that from me. Anyway, I like number 18, bad picture of command module. That's because I didn't know anything about close-up photography or how close you could get with a camera. And I remember the picture was blurry because I'd just gotten it really close to the very top of the rocket. So then in 1973, so what, that's about 13 years later, I had, our neighbor ran a newspaper, the weekly paper in Lexington, Virginia, and they used high school kids for stringers, and I was going in the 10th grade after that summer, and I had begged my parents for a 35 millimeter camera, didn't really know what that meant, but I'd seen pictures of them and thought, cool, I'd get one. Well, I was in the hospital, I had uh, some medical issues back then, and because in the hospital, it was a great time to hit your parents up for a bigger gift than you'd ever get normally in life. And my dad went across town to a catalog store and came back with this Minolta SRT 101, this camera right here. And that was my first 35 millimeter camera. And my father, my neighbor, the, the guy that had the paper, had told me if I ever get a good camera, I could shoot pictures for the paper. So that fall, I hit him up to shoot some pictures. And I made ter two terrible photos. One was like a guy signing a check on a Xerox machine as a donation to the Interact Club, whatever the heck that was. Had two in the paper with my name, which is the big part, right? 
I mean, there's my name under a photo in the newspaper. I must be cool and important and not a nerd. And so um, the uh, found out after the second one was published that I actually would get paid something for that, $2.50 each. I got five bucks for my first professional check. So then um, I was in the hospital when they gave me the picture, the camera, so I loaded a roll of film and shot whatever's around me. That's the first picture with that camera. That's my mom's cool cat eyeglasses and perm hair every week and my dad, who's still a nerd. And um, flowers in a window, any nurse who came in the room got a picture. Uh, and these are the kind of things, you know, I teach basic photography. And one thing that basic photography students take pictures of are their, is, are their cats and dogs. And, you know, I'm, I kind of try to steer them away from it, but there I am, there's our cat, there's our dog, there's an owl that flew into the back tree, and there's my Aunt Rosie, who was a character. This was the kind of material available to somebody in 1973. We didn't have the internet, no YouTube. You know, my students can YouTube anything, you know. What happens if you shoot ISO 1600 versus 3200? Somebody's made a YouTube on that. But not a lot of information flowing into Lexington, Virginia for a kid interested in photography. So this was the instruction manual. And I always think of this, because for those of you who know what this is, this is depth of field table for an MC Roker 58 millimeter 1.4 lens. And look at these numbers. And I remember opening that up, looking at it, and thinking, I'll get back to this later. <laughs> I was sitting in the car in the driveway when I did that. And so when my students are having trouble figuring out depth of field, I try to remember how confusing it can be. Um, so let's see here. So this is the stuff that was available to you. Notice who published all these books. Kodak. So they were trying to sell materials, so bigger and better enlarging and creative techniques. But this was the sort of thing my parents would give me for Christmas, and I was trying to learn photography. I had no idea of the wider world of photography that was out there. I just wasn't privy to it. So I was taking pictures like this, or like this. I was working for the yearbook in high school. I did that for three years. And then I went to uh, Washington and Lee University some years later, 1980. What year did I start? I was there seven years. I started, I graduated in 76, so 77 I started at WNL. And in 1980, I was offered the job as assistant university photographer. A lot of you guys know JR. So I was sort of a JR at that university, JR and Chetta, for a few years. And I ran into this guy who was my boss named Patrick Heinley. And we had, we were in the journalism building on the fourth floor. We had a key to get up to the dark room in an elevator. So only we, myself, another assistant, and Patrick got up there. And he got up there, and Patrick's got all these prints, sort of like I put out, out here, on his walls. And I came from shooting you know, newspaper stuff at that point. I'd done a lot of news, 10 years of newspaper pictures, which weren't real sophisticated, that paper. And you know anything I could shoot, but I didn't really know much. And I, I kept looking at Patrick's pictures. He was doing something called street photography. And this picture in particular, just. I remember looking at it thinking, well, why the hell did he shoot that? What's the point of that picture? But I go back and look at it again. And I would hate to have to tell you why that's an amazing photograph. But if you spend some time with it, I mean, it's like every person in it is an isolated portrait. And it's an it's a, uh, auction in Fairfield, Virginia, outdoor auction, you know, just a bunch of farmers and people standing around thinking about what they might bid on, waiting for stuff to happen. So it's kind of a picture of time and you know, it's just a very, where people are placed, it's really an interesting picture to me. Patrick ended up giving me this print of it years later, I asked him for, as it stuck in my head, so. So, street photography, once I started looking into it, Patrick shot with a Leica M3. That camera was made in 1954, or thereabouts, designed in 1954. And it turns out a lot of street photographers use Leicas, so I got a Leica. Why a Leica? Well, cameras are different. Different cameras do different things well. You hand somebody a Polaroid versus that 8x10 out there, and you're going to have different approaches, different ways you can use it, different subjects that will actually work for that camera. And Leicas, for lots of funny little simple reasons that would take me a while to explain, are very good for street photography, especially a little bit of a wide-angle lens on them. These are very famous street photographers. cartier Bresson is the top left. Next one down is Robert Frank, who did a book called The Americans. And the one on the right is a Gary Winogrand picture that I love from the Space Center from a Apollo launch. Everyone's looking at the take the blast off, and this one woman's photographing back toward Winogrand. So that's street photography, often humorous or just the human moment. It's wandering the world with your camera at ready. It's kind of like hunting. 
and you've got to react very quickly when you see something. That's the skill. So you set the camera up in a way that's faster than autofocus. You don't have to focus. You use depth of field scales. So, and it must be true that if you do it well, you're pretty well hidden, because whoever saw the queen shooting pictures, right? That's a Leica M3, that camera right there. The queen shot Leicas our whole life. Interesting. So I get interested in the street photography stuff that Patrick's doing, want to try it out. And I'm looking back through my old negatives years later. 1973, I got that Minolta. And on my very first roll of black and white film, I find this photo. And this is at a country store in Virginia. The store is off to the right, that road to the right. It's back here. And I remember we drove in, and I saw the goats up there. It's called Evans Store. Saw the goats up there and thought, that's funny, by that Dr. Pepper sign, fresh cut meat. So I walked up there and shot this picture. I would shoot that same picture this minute if, I, if it was in front of me. In fact, I could probably prove some of it. Here's one about 10 years later. Critters and weird signs. Pork, what a good idea. That's at the Illinois State Fair. This is uh, in South Dakota a few years after that. So it's, it's kind of a theme. We're going to look at 150 of these now. Ready? Um, so, yeah, but it's that, you know, one thing I like is humor in photography. So it's that irony, discordant moment, foreground and background are weird. This is driving up a little road to uh, Dead Horse to photograph a rodeo. And things that are good for street photography, rodeos, festivals, anything outdoors, anything where people are busy and will ignore you. So I was going to rodeo to shoot it. And I'm driving along. I'm in a VW camper. And the VW campers will do a U-turn on the two-lane. And you can sleep in them. So two good reasons are good for photography. So I'm driving along. And there's these uh, fish farm signs that you see, like Burma Shave. Every quarter mile, there's a sign about somebody's fish farm. And there's a picture of a fish on all of them. This one, the fish had fallen off, and there's two door horses grazing in the background. So that's like the photo gods going, stop, you know, pick up your camera, you fool. So here's a few street photos. This is in Virginia. I could tell you a story about every one of these, but it would take us all night. But this is at the Kroger parking lot in Virginia. This is in Clayton, Georgia. Dog named Hammer waiting for his morning biscuit. This is in Florida. Now, one thing people ask me a lot is, did I set that picture up? Because that's the cheapest thing you can do in a photograph you're trying to pass off as yours. No. She was over there on her towel reading the magazine. I did get caught, though. When you do street work, you're trying not to be noticed with the camera. So you develop a lot of techniques to be looking over there or you know, anything but taking the picture of Dave there if he's sitting there doing, picking his nose or something. You know? so, I, uh, so I'm, I sneak over there, and I'm shooting a Hasselblad. You know what a Hasselblad is? It's a bigger camera. You're looking down at it. It's kind of a big thing. And I'm trying to get ready to shoot this picture. She's exactly like this. And all of a sudden, she senses I'm there and goes, and I went, hmm, uh, I was trying to get a picture of the back of your magazine. So she looks at it, never said a word to me, looked at the back of the magazine, held it back up, and I shot the picture and walked off. And so uh, that's like Cindy Crawford, I think, on the back. Um, this picture was at the East Wing of the National Gallery of Art. And you know, I give some of these titles. This one's called Escher Was Right. This is if you know Escher's drawing. It's the day I dropped my 35 millimeter lens on the marble floor, too. Sad day. Then I moved to Fairbanks. This is one of the first pictures I took in Fairbanks at Bentley Mall, back when Fairbanks was visually exciting for me, 40 some years ago. This is in Safeway at Fairbanks. I mean, you walk in a store, there's cream cheese and pigs. Picture screaming at you. This is during Open North American. Um, in Virginia, they don't get a picture like this, right? Or they think it's a beach, which I call Fairbanks Beach. It's beach sand and snow look a lot alike in photographs. But the weird thing is, whoa, stop, stop, what did I do? I, now you guys got to pretend you didn't see any of that. Is this. Why are there shoes? I've never, you know, you, you, and you find stuff later in your photographs that you don't see. You claim you saw everything, but you really, you're winging it because you're shooting fast. And, but I don't remember seeing the shoes at the time, but there they are. So I guess somebody may put on boots. <laughs> Who knows? But you know those warm spring days when it's really nice out. This is called Pipeline Supporters. And you know the old trick, of course, like with the Leaning Tower Pisa, and you 
you get your friend to hold their hands, and you're trying to line it up so it looks like they're holding it, and that's what their friend was doing. I thought it was much more interesting if you kind of spill the beans. Anybody know Dermot Cole? So when I worked at the News Miner, there was a magazine, this was a long time ago, my first five years here, there was a magazine there called um, Heartland. And they used to put, on the back page of Heartland, they used to put these goofy wire photos, like somebody taking their dentures out and pulling their lip up near their nose, and just stupid things that, that they got off AP wire. And I suddenly discovered that I could have that back page every week and could put anything I wanted on it. And so I would do things like this. Do you remember that, Eric? So, um, so we ran this as a big picture on the back of Heartland. No explanation, just, you know, I think probably put the title on it. And Dermot comes up to me, and Dermot's like, Ch -ch -ch Charles, what, I, what, I gotta ask you about this. I'm like, what? He goes, well, why'd you print this picture in the paper? Because, you know, you missed. <laughs> and I thought, oh, well, Dermot. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, Pizza Hut, also North American. That's downtown. I, I remember I had a real wide angle lens on that day. And I thought it was hilarious that a town that has a perfectly clear street would bring in bulldozers or uh, dump trucks full of snow and drop them on 2nd Avenue. They don't do that anymore, but they used to drop snow and grade it out for the dog teams to run on. And then there'd be people shoveling at the intersections as they let a few cars through and then they'd shovel some snow and there'd be a cop there. And the cop was always holding up his arm to let, stop the traffic and there's the elbow room bar. And I just thought, you know, this all kind of could work. So I'm sneaking up on the cop with my wide angle and he keeps thinking he's in the way and keeps moving away from me. <laughs> and I'm waiting for a team to go by. This is not easy stuff, people. Um, this is in Seattle at Nordstrom's. Strictly for food. This is one morning I walked down and my dog is watching out the window a young moose. Sorry? Yep. Uh, it's over at the Botanical Garden. They had a hat over their face. I don't have to worry about being busted on that one. This is my friend's baby. She's, moved, she's uh, almost finished her master's degree in anthropology. Sam Bishop's daughter, Nell, at the bakery restaurant. Jasper, Alberta, Boston. So, you know, if you're a photographer and you see somebody come with a unicycle reading a newspaper on their way to work, it's like easy pickings. This is in front of my parents' house in Virginia. There was this flood, and you can see where the water had gotten up. It's just, ah, I did it again. Where the water had gotten up here in the fence. Um, overnight, and I came out in their driveway, and there were two snapping turtles high centered on rocks in their driveway. It's like a biblical thing, you know. And the turtles couldn't get off the rocks because they somehow been, I mean, I don't know how it all worked, but I let one go, and then I went in and got my camera and came back out and let the other one go. And when we were kids and played in that creek, my grandmother always said, Watch out for the snapping turtles because if they ever bite you, they won't let go until it thunders. And I thought, Oh, wow, there's a picture. Somebody walking around with a snapping turtle hanging off their arm looking for a storm, right? So I want a picture of a snapping turtle. And every time, first of all, they're not grateful when you take them off a rock. They're, you know, you're, you're like grabbing them from behind and pushing them because they, they do snap. And then every time I got too close, it would stop and snap at me. So I had to kind of play the distance right. But you can even see his toenails in there. And it's called Jurassic Snapper. He went over there, got underwater, and disappeared. Space Center, kid doing what kids do by an astronaut and satellite shaped topiary. You wonder what Fairbanks is missing? There you know. This is here in Fairbanks, a rodeo. Uh, I don't know, you know, most places I don't think rodeos would let you get up above the bullpen and photograph. But Fairbanks, you can kind of get away with that stuff. At least you could then. It was a, over at the fairgrounds. And again, you don't see all this until later, but this is called rodeo hands. And there's hand, 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 and all that's the nice stuff you find later when you, you got a sense of the picture, but you get to, they, they make it fit. So it's Seattle Ferry. Explain that one. <laughs> he propped his suit up there to look like another person. And that's in Paris. And these are the three most recent street pictures. This was, uh, uh, we went to Paris in November. So everything you've looked at here is film except for the, the last one and these three. It's in the Musée d'Orsay. 
and then Rue Claire, where we stayed. Paris is like the mother load for street photography, and, and in history it is as well. It's where Cartier-Bresson is from, you know. So, we're getting to Denali slowly. Six pictures from six works. So over the years, you know, as a photographer, you do different things. I was a journalist, so first thing here, I want to show you a few pictures from the whale rescue in 1988. You were here then. So three gray whales got stuck in the ice in Barrow, and the whole world appeared in Barrow to, to document their, their rescue. And um, so these were all shot for, uh, a lot of them ended up in magazines. They were shot for the newspaper, too. This was uh, Double Truck in Life, which is a pretty exciting day for a photographer when you get to open that up. And um, so these are some pictures, six pictures from that, spending 11 days in Barrow watching people chainsaw holes to try to get the whales out to uh, where an icebreaker can break a path in. This is the first day there. California gray whales. You guys remember this story? So as a photographer, you know, you're running around trying to document everything and shoot all the time and, and get something different and get something you didn't get yesterday and it's 20 below and you're on Pea, pea snow on ice and you know you're sweating and freezing all at once and it was a great story <laughs> got good pictures though it was fun this is from the helicopter uh that's point barrow that little i'm not very good at this uh this was point barrow strip of land the original hole is back here and the natives up in barrow had cut you can see them here there's spray coming off that 48 inch bar chainsaw which was donated and they're cutting this ice path out to the open water that's going to be made by an icebreaker. And then a little series that I did on reindeer herding back in 1990. Uh, I heard about reindeer herding and didn't know what it looked like. And I tried to get the news miner to send me out to Nome to photograph reindeer herding. And it was like a $600 ticket and the news miner wasn't going to pay for that. So that year I got the job teaching here. And I quit the news miner in May so I could just pay my own way to Nome, I think it was in June, and photograph this stuff. And I got there, I had no idea what it would look like. That's, that's a later picture from a little helicopter that Larry Davis out in Nome owned of about 1,400 reindeer in corral. They circle when they get nervous, sort of like a school of fish, or it's biological behavior. And so they build a corral around so they don't hurt, they stay in a circle and don't crush each other. And you can walk, I did this, scary as heck the first time, but you can go into that. They're running here. They're not just standing there. They're moving. You can go into it, and they'll part like a river and go around you. So, you know, you always see the westerns of the cattle stampedes, and they, everybody dies in those. Well, these guys, I don't, they don't touch with the reindeer. This is the very first picture I took, sticking my camera through the corral gate when we got out there. It was real dry year, real dusty, and I knew when I saw this I was going to have a good couple of days. And it was just try to keep up with what I saw. Very few times that that happens in life. And it was a great series. This is pushing reindeer uh, along to one of the smaller holding areas. They hold up burlap and come at them. It's called fishing. And you're pushing the reindeer to another small corral. That this, you know, photojournalists and documentary street photographers and all, we always used to print with our black borders because it showed the whole negative showed you were a real cool photographer. If you could not crop, you didn't have to find the picture in the picture. But I got so lucky because that reindeer's nose is right at the edge of that border. Uh, stuff you can't plan until later. These are all shot with a little Leica, by the way, for you nerds out there. Um, this is another view of the fishing. This is, so what reindeer market at that point, I think it's kind of crashed now, but it was on antler going to Southeast Asia, the Asian market, aphrodisiac really, but they call it medicinal, wafers, powders, and you cut the antler off in velvet, fresh velvet, a lot of blood during this, one reason I went black and white, plus I like black and white, as you can tell, and um, it's more like cutting your fingernail, though, there's no nerve in the antler, so it doesn't, it's not like you cut their leg off, but they cut their antler off, and they sold them, 68 bucks a pound that year, and a lot of antlers, you'll see, uh, is, uh, lots of it, a truck full for a few nights in a row. And then here's where the photo gods smile again. You need an ending picture in a photo series, and I didn't know what it was going to be, maybe some pile of antler or something. And every now and then a reindeer would get past the people who were trying to cut the antler off. And 
they go group up on a hillside nearby. So that happened, and then a fog rolled through in that next valley. And it's like 3 in the morning, I look up, and there's one antler, antlered reindeer, and then these things that would otherwise look like cows. And that fog makes it show up because it's light behind it. Okay, so one of my other interests in the world is dinosaurs in America. <laughs> so some of these series were done tightly, like reindeer, were done in two nights. Uh, of course, the whale rescue is 11 days. Others are going to be lifetime projects. Whenever I find a reindeer, uh, dinosaur, I photograph it. So this is the Albuquerque Museum. And in street photography, you're in humorous street photography, you know, you're looking for people to be people. And then you're looking for cool things that lets them do that. So they have this thing set up there where you can stick your head in a dinosaur. And through its eyeballs, you can kind of see this foliage they planted as if a dinosaur would see this. So it's dinosaur stuff. And for me, you know, you go around the corner and you wait. And somebody's going to come along and stick their head in that thing. So that's, that's what's going on here. This is at a McDonald's in Tucson. This is up on a hill out of Grand... Uh, What's the big town in South Dakota? Uh, to where, Rapid City. They've got a dinosaur park on top of the hill. You drive through Rapid City, you see dinosaurs on the hill. It's cool. This is in uh, Vernal, Utah. That's in Santa Fe. Somebody art, somebody's artwork in Santa Fe. This is the most recent down in um, Hatch, New Mexico. And I saw the flag in there. You know, and you're shooting, it's not digital, this is film. so. You don't know what you got till later, so you're trying to get that flag and a dinosaur it's whapping in the wind, trying to get it all to just line up. Kind of like that. Okay, circus. So I went to a circus here. Back, there used to be a little circus, a little mud show that showed up here uh, 15 years ago. And came every year, more or less, for about four times. One elephant circus. Anybody ever go to that? It's over, right now the FedEx ground operation is where it used to park. At the end of Pager or... Hager and Van Horn, but on the right. So I go over there and photograph. The first time I showed up and told the ringmaster what I wanted to do, they're like, yeah, well, whatever. You know, they weren't very nice. And very... But I went home that night and made prints for them and took them back the next day. And then I was golden, you know. He, he took prints to anybody, and that's how you made friends. So this is just hanging around backstage at the, fir at the circus for a couple of years. And they're doing their thing, and I'm doing mine. Very, very low. These are two, you know, maybe 14 year old boys in this. Yeah. Lots of kid stuff. One elephant. That's the ringmaster. He was a Chicago attorney who quit and joined the circus, or actually started or became a ringmaster. This is called Backstage at the Circus. Another real photo, not set up. I'm not that smart. One frame <laughs> with the Hasselblad, that weird camera again. And then I shot this picture, and some of you might recognize the next thing. I just figured out a cool way to show you this. So this was seen by someone uh, that was looking at for pictures for a book cover for Getty, and they did that with it. So if you ever saw the book Water for Elephants, it has this picture on it. But this is what they saw, and then they figured out the color and all. Normally you'd hate that if somebody did that to your photo, but I think they did a really excellent job. And that was like number one on New York Times bestseller list for a year and a half. Now when you do photography, stock photography, which is now dead, but back then you get paid ahead of time. So when somebody's writing a book and looking for a cover, they don't know it's going to be number one on the New York Times bestseller list for a year and a half. So you get paid whatever that is. I think I got $1,200 or half of $1,200 because the agency gets it half. She got $4 million for her next advance, <laughs> Sarah Groon. But I got a pretty cool picture out of it and the cover shot. And then, uh, then I chased zoos for a while. I went to 15 zoos, small zoos. This was the first picture I shot in Anchorage, and it started the zoo project. Um, that photographer, Gary Winogrand, had done a book back in the 60s called The Animals. Lovely little book, about 30 photos, one of my favorite photo books. In the Bronx Zoo in New York and the aquarium, he lived in New York, and he just wandered over and shoot the people and the critters and whatever and did this little book. And I always loved it, and I didn't see anybody do zoos after that. So I shot this at Camel down in uh, Anchorage and was looking at it thinking, man, i got to shoot more zoos. So I, I went a little nuts and did about 15 of them over the years. And then I quit because zoos are a really depressing place to hang out if, if you care about the animals, it turns out, especially the apes. 
but I went to about a bunch of them. So this, you get what's going on here? When Gary Renegrand shot zoos, they were all uh, moats. You know, animals were, uh, there was, you know, various fencing and things like that. Now they use plexiglass a lot. So you literally can be an inch from a gorilla. And so here, this kid, just to explain what might be obvious, that kid's face is now on the baby gorilla's body because of the reflection in the plexiglass. And this is the only digital project I'm showing you tonight. Um, so this is a tapir in Seattle. And again, using the plexi to reflect people looking at it. This is in Albuquerque. It's a crocodile, not an alligator. I call it alligator once, and somebody who knows more than me said, no, 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 that's a crocodile. So now it's a crocodile. So I was kind of playing with this barriers and environs that these critters end up in. It's probably my only humorous shot from about the whole series, the giraffes down in Albuquerque. So that's a human being on the left and a gorilla on the right. And they're literally, you know, a plexiglass width apart. And then kudzu. So you said I'm from the south. 1993, I shot this picture in Clayton, Georgia. And I got obsessed with kudzu, and I still am. I really, I shot kudzu this, this May. And kudzu, does everybody know what kudzu is? I'd be surprised. Kudzu is a, it's a vine that was brought in from Asia over 100 years ago, mostly to the deep south, to put on cut banks that roads, when roads were built, people cut away all the, the and nothing was left with soil. They put kudzu on it, it would grow. It grows a foot a day in length, the vine in the summer. In the winter, the leaves drop off and you have vines, you'll see. So I think it's pretty cool. It's metaphoric, it's like clouds, it's like, it's just cool stuff if you're out looking for it. There's a kudzu boat or a boat on a kudzu sea with a kudzu bow wave. And I was shooting this picture. You know, in the south, you have to be careful sometimes. It's like here. You go on a gold mine site, you may want to be careful, right? But well, in the south, you take a two-lane road out, and then you're stopped by somebody's on somebody's road, and um, you think you're okay, but I'm on top of the car, the rent a car, with my camera to take this picture, and all of a sudden I hear behind me, can I help you? <laughs> I thought, hmm. Probably from that trailer down the road. And sure enough, and I went, I explained to the guy what I was doing. And he said, huh, my daughter says she's a photographer. She don't take no cool pictures like this. So I said, I'm going to bring you a print. And a couple of years later, I took him a print. And he's like, I never thought I'd see you again. And, but it's, uh, it was his, his boat and his property, and I was violating it. But he was cool. So kudzu. This is a back road in, in Alabama. It grows up wires. It grows up. It grows over houses. It grows over your grandmother rocking too slow, you know. It's just an amazing plant. And it looks like other stuff, like you see shapes in clouds, or you can find shapes in kudzu. That's the winter kudzu. So in the summer, this would just be a big blob. It holds up satellite dishes. I think it's interesting, because I used to photograph satellite dishes. And I think I quit. But these, you know, every now and then your projects cross. And um, this satellite dish was old. I remember when the first ones came out, we, when I was working with that little weekly paper in Lexington, we had assignments to go photograph the first satellite dishes in town that were being sold to people for whatever, TV or something. And now this is an old one almost. It's almost aged, and Kudzu's holding it up. So how about this picture? Anybody see anything in it? Elephant? So again, projects cross at times. That's in Clayton, Georgia, that Kudzu elephant, and that's the one elephant from the circus here. But yeah, it's definitely, to me, an elephant. And so, you know, it's a cool thing to go out and look for. Okay, so now we're going to get to the meat of the evening, I guess. Um, so let's spend a minute talking about digital photography. So in 1990, I got my first digital camera. I meant to bring the memory cards tonight. I got a Nikon D1, 2.74 megapixels. My first two memory cards, which I still have, were 160 megabytes. Camera cost $5,000 for 2.74 megapixels. The 160 megabyte cards were $500 each. 1,000 bucks for 320 megabytes to go shoot. And you had to carry three or four batteries, big batteries, you know, like eight AA equivalents. 
three or four of those to shoot one assignment. I mean, it's really progressed what we have now. This, this thing I can shoot all day. Um, so, but when digital came in, lots of things happened. I made a little list here so I wouldn't forget of some of my good and bad things about digital versus film. On my phone, I have 89,557 pictures. I can beat anybody in this room. But I do. I have 89,000. I checked it. That's a fraction of the, of the digital images I have in my life. I have terabytes of hard drives. I have more pictures. You know in the Smithsonian they say if you spent, what, 30 seconds looking at every object, it takes 500 years? That's the way I feel about my digital pictures now. But I sort of felt that way about film because I have a lot of negatives. <laughs> A lot of negatives I've never been through very well. I'm not sure what to do about those. I'm 65. How many years do I have? Can I look through everything? No, it's not going to happen. So, but digital's worse than film in, in lots of ways. It's better and it's worse. But you accumulate it so quickly. You, you take pictures of everything for any reason at all now. And you know, photography used to be kind of special. I remember my dad, he gave me that camera. We went to New England in 1973 on a one week long trip. I took four rolls of film with me. If I shot more than one picture of one item, of one thing, he would say, don't waste film. Years later, he said, I'm glad you wasted film, Charles. But, <laughs> but uh, with digital, we, there's nothing to waste. It's free. That's good. My students learn a lot faster with free film. We loan them cameras and cards. So digital's got a lot of good things. But it also is this accumulating dinosaur of images for anybody that's shooting a lot. Okay, so uh, um, I just did an assignment a couple weeks ago down in Ketchikan. It's ultimately for the National Archives. National Archives, what do they want you to shoot for 500-year archival work? Film. Film. In particular, view camera film. 4x5, 5x7, or 8x10. They have very strict processing guidelines. I have to process it myself. I have to selenium tone the negatives as well as the prints, if anybody knows what that means in here. And they don't consider digital is not archival. Free neutrinos are destroying your digital files, even as you sit there. And so over time, digital stuff is corrupted, corroded. If anybody's tried to, you know, where's your VHS tapes? That wasn't digital. But still, it's the same thing with, with, with any digital file. How many times can you move it? If you've got 15 terabytes, how many times can you copy those? Are you ever going to look through them anyway? So it's a problem. So what I decided in Ketchikan is with digital, if you're doing an assignment for somebody, you're paid to shoot first and maybe think later when you're editing. With 4x5 film, you're paid to think and then shoot. And I kind of like that. You know, It was a refreshing moment to shoot for someone as an assignment and have, have to shoot a slow camera like the one out there. Um, Good things about film, you get instant feedback. Sort of like in the old days we used Polaroid. Look at the back of your screen. You can show somebody a picture very easily now. You can email it to them. I mean, that part's easy with digital, much easier than film. When I'm shooting film, if I promise somebody a photo, first of all, if I do it and don't deliver, that's terrible. But there's multiple steps if you're shooting film to try, you know, at least you're gonna have to scan it and email it to them. And they won't see it right away. Um, large, uh, let's see. So that's good and bad, the instant feedback too, though, because it makes you, what's the word, everybody, for looking at your digital over and over and over? Anybody know that word? Chimping. You chimp. And I guess it comes from, picture, you know, because you're constantly <laughs> looking. So when you, when you do that as a photographer, you teleport yourself to your camera, to the scene, camera scene, camera scene. Whereas with film, you lift the camera to your eye, you shoot the picture, but you're still interacting with your subject. And it's really hard to turn that LCD off. Leica actually makes a camera, just like this one, that has no LCD, but it's digital. I'm not sure that makes sense. But, um, so chimping's bad, instant technical feedback is good. The bad thing about, when I was shooting those whale pictures, I was on slide film. If you ever shot slide film in your life, that's the scariest film to shoot on assignment. And you're shipping it raw, I was shipping it out of Barrow every night. There was no FedEx in Alaska, so they were having hand carriers meet it at the airports, costing $240 a night. But I wake up in Barrow the next morning, and they were looking at New York on a light table. They'd already processed it. But they also see how sucky you are, because you, you screw up slide film. You mess up exposures. You can't avoid it. You can't be perfect. And slide film was the pickiest. So if you're overexposed, underexposed, they're all knowing how crappy you are. 
as a photographer. And you're always worried about that when you're shooting that and delivering it as slides. If you're processing it yourself, at least you get to edit it first. But when somebody's seeing your raw film, with digital, you know whether you got a good exposure or not. You got a histogram, for God's sake. I wish I'd put histogram on film cameras so we could see a chart of our exposure. But um, so that's uh, instant feedback is good. Delivery for assignments in digital, great. I mean, I'd much rather shoot an assignment digitally if I got to deliver it to somebody tomorrow because I just have to zip through, edit it, and ship it. Film, you got to process, scan, whatever you're going to do. Um, digital, let's see. Uh, some things here I wrote, I don't know what they mean anymore, and I just wrote them today. Uh, it's cheaper than film once you've bought in. So you can shoot digital for free. How much is film, Matt? Ten, twelve, fifteen bucks a roll for black and white. Film is fifteen dollars a roll these days, you know? Let's talk about sheet film. Sheet film. Five by seven uh, a check before he came. T Max four hundred five by seven fifty sheets, four hundred dollars. That's eight bucks a sheet, I think. Yeah. So film's expensive. Um, with film, you have cool, interesting cameras. Not so much so with digital. They tend to all be the same model, way too many buttons. Uh, with film, you get surprise, which is going to be part of the collodion here in a minute. You get magic. Digital's meant to be perfect. Digital is perfect. You, know? you only keep the ones that look perfect. It's very hard to screw up digital in any interesting way. Um, so happy accidents happen with film, not so much with digital. So it's easy to make what I wrote. It's easy to make digital images, and they are long, but they are no longer made by hand. With film in a dark room, you felt like you were making something. That's an editorial comment. I have a feeling. Um, I should use your blue tape. Um, Anyway, with film and in a dark room, you know, you, dark rooms you go in, harder to do when you get kids and stuff, but you go in, you turn off the light, you turn on the radio, and you know you're going to be in there for three or four hours. That's lovely. There's no equivalent to that sitting at a computer and talking on the phone and emailing and checking Instagram and also working on a photo. And, you know, but it's real easy to print a big print from a digital file and look at it in a minute. That's harder in the dark. So all this good and bad stuff. But it kind of drove me. So in 1990, I went digital with a good camera. And I'm still digital. I still shoot a lot of digital. But I also still shoot a lot of film. And I really appreciate what the film does. Oh, don't worry about that, Gail. Really. We'll, we'll deal with it later. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, though. Um, I thought you were leaving. I thought I'd pissed you off or something. <laughs> so I really, and I, as, as I think about the future, I'm more interested in film and collodion than I am digital. But that doesn't mean I'll quit digital. It just means for my own work, I want to keep continuing to emphasize film more. So um, this, by the way, was one camera that I took to Paris in, for one week in uh, November. Look at the bottom number, 3,111 items. The collodion stuff you're going to see here in a minute, and you might have glanced at out there, I shot under 100 plates in 10 days in the park. But before we get there, I want to show you why I think I was interested. Because you know, people ask me, why'd you do this? I go, well, the only answer I can really give you is I don't know how to make these images in any other way that you're going to see. But through the years, I've been interested in happy accidents. Uh, if you've shot much 35 millimeter, you know when you're winding up to frame number one, you always are clicking the cam you got to click a couple of frames off. And there used to be this frame, it's probably still on there, called zero A. And that was on the way to frame number one. And often that was like the seat of your car, your feet, or a cloud. Something, you're just winding the camera and clicking it. And we used to think, God, those, those might be the most interesting thing on this roll of film, you know, that thing I shot without thinking about. And we were always going to do a zero A show. I think it's passe now, but um, it was uh, a thought. So this is a Polaroid negative. You got to teleport yourself back a little bit here. Polaroid used to make these lovely films before they went defunct, like a lot of things in the digital world. And this was a little pack film, 665. And the reason that it and another film that they made called Type 55 were so cool is because you could shoot a Polaroid out in the field, and if you took care of the negative, it was an actual film negative. Panatomic X, Kodak made the negative. 
Most Polaroid, if you've been around them, is either the SX-70 kind of thing that spits out and then you watch it develop. Or it was a pack film, like when you're a kid, if you're old enough, you went to Santa Claus, and they take your Santa Claus picture, and they wait 15 seconds, peel it, and then coat it. Remember that smell, that coating? Um, and then they throw the paper negative away. It was no good. But they made these two films that had an actual film negative. You could take them back to the darkroom, clear them, and print them in an enlarger, and they're beautiful films. So this was 665, and the, the part that I liked, other, well, there were lots of parts, but if you look at this border here, that line, there's a line going up here and around. That's where the print came off. There's kind of a little, uh, like a uh, glassine between the print and the negative. And, but the negative was bigger. So the negative had a little bit outside that line, and then it had these ratty edge, edges. And that always reminded me of very old photographs I'd see from the Civil War or other places. And so here's a Type 55. So I was playing with this. This is a couple of... Uh, one of the series I didn't show you was pregnant people. I shot those for a while. So these are two pregnant women underneath like a tablecloth. What I did with the negative though was I put, went home and put it in water to just see what happened. Let's see what happens with this negative. I just let it start to dissolve. And it started stripping over a couple of days like this and I just thought it was so cool. So I grabbed it and printed it. It, it died, you know, it destroyed itself. But that was kind of thing that was interesting to me because it wasn't what you expected in those happy accidents. Um, here's another thing. Somewhere in here there's a landscape, but what I did here was I put the paper back on the negative and then you know, let it all dry and later peeled it apart. And what's what here, I don't know. This is more like collodion than anything else I, I did. But there's a landscape behind all this, but there's a bunch of crap there from the peeling the negative. And then finally, this one isn't a Polaroid, but if you look at that arch on the top there, that's a total, I screwed up. I was learning 4x5 at the time. With 4x5, you can move the lens up and down uh, relative to the negative. This was taken in Alaska land in 1985. But I had uh, risen, yeah, everything's upside down and backwards in a view camera. So I'd taken the lens too far up to keep everything straight, and I'd hit the image circle of the cheap lens I was using. However, I couldn't have designed that better. Yeah, I mean, I love that arch above the American Gothic 1985 people, which, by the way, I didn't know would look like American Gothic until I developed the negative. I was just trying to get a picture of them in their bus. But um, so that kind of stuff was always fun, the 0A thing. This is as close as you can get in digital. This is a very, like, five-stop underexposure. If you looked at this image on the back of your camera or on a computer, it was black. So I thought, well, I'll just open it up and see what's there. And it's kind of an image of the sensor and the noise and the crap and all. But it's kind of interesting to me uh, down in uh, Saguaro East in Tucson. So there's a form of crap in digital, but generally digital wants to be perfect. So let's talk about Clody in a minute and photography in case there will be a quiz. And I'll, this isn't going to go a lot longer, you guys, if you're watching time. Um, Photography was invented in 1827 with an asphalt medium, literally asphalt. The first picture was made, don't ask me how, but it's still around. I don't have a picture of it here tonight, but Neeps made it. So there's still a fixed image of a courtyard made somehow with asphalt and light something, something that, I don't know. And, but in 1838, daguerreotypes, you probably heard of those. They're, they were on a little, like a mirror, a metal, piece of metal developed in mercury fumes. So a lot of photographers that were doing those went a little nuts over the years. And um, very dangerous process. There are people still doing daguerreotypes. I mean, my, what I do is dangerous enough. Um, and, but the problem with photography back then is everything you made was life-size that you made it. So unless you shot a really big camera, which is problematic for things like daguerreotypes and materials and chemicals and everything, you didn't get a big image. You got, so you've probably seen Lots of little old tin types in the past and things like that. Everything was the same size with tin. Uh, so photographers were trying to figure out a way to make an image that they could mul make multiple copies of because it's all original. You have a daguerreotype, it's original. There's no way to copy it. It's in how, how could you make multiple copies? How can you make prints of an image? So glass was the obvious answer, but how do you make glass light sensitive? Well, in Civil War, collodion... You've heard of liquid band-aid, collodion. Collodion was being used in the Civil War to both bandage 
wounded soldiers as well as to take pictures of them because collodion turned out to be the secret. And Frederick Scott Archer invented the wet plate in 1851, before the Civil War. And collodion is uh, gun cotton and ether, uh, gun cotton dissolved in ether and alcohol. And it gives you this kind of like a syrup. It's completely clear. You pour it on a glass plate, as you'll see in a minute, and then you can pour most of it off and end up with this thin layer that's transparent to capture an image. The trick is you've got to make the chemicals work, and for that you use iodides and bromides, and you put the collodion into the collodion iodides and bromides, like uh, cadmium iodide or potassium uh, bromide or one of those, or both of them. And then when you put that plate in silver nitrate, those iodides and bromides get converted to silver iodide, silver bromides, which are light sensitive. Now you've got a plate that you can record an image on. So that's the trick with wet plate. That's all of it. You'll, I'm going to give you a quick little video here to show you how it works. So now you can go out in the field with bigger, because glass you can carry, you know, they were shooting 20 by 24 inch wet plates in the 1850s, 60s, 70s. You could go out and shoot big glass. You can make prints of it, multiple copies. You can treat it in a way that makes it a positive. I put it on black glass or tin. A tin type is collodion on black tin. Now it's on black aluminum. And um, it became very popular from 51 to 71. That was it. That was the digital of the time. That was the high tech stuff. It spread around the world so quickly. I don't, it's amazing to me how fast this stuff did. So by the time Civil War gets here, that's what everybody's shooting. Any picture you've ever seen in American Civil War, shot on collodion. Trick is, you've got to have your darkroom with you. It's called wet plate as well because if you let it dry, it's no good. So you go out there, you, you'll see the process here in a minute. And you've got 10 or 15 minutes to do this, depending on humidity and everything. In 1871, uh, Kodak brought out a box of dry plates. Glass, pre-coated by Kodak, that you take out, put in your holders, go to the Egypt, come home to Alaska, and process it at your leisure. So who wants to carry a darkroom anymore? Wet plate died until photography rediscovered it maybe 20 years ago. There are more wet plate photographers now than there were in the 1850s and 60s and 70s because it's, it's not digital, so people are just like me. Then 1888, George Eastman came out with a little camera, Brownie, that held 100, a roll that could shoot 100 images, and then he sent it in and got it processed, and they'd send you prints. So wet plate died. Um, so the American Civil War, notice some things about this picture, this hole. Um, these ruggedy edge, raggedy edges, uh, this is all because it's done by hand and you're pouring a collodion on. You'll see that in some of my prints here, or my images tonight. This is an area, like a little island of glass where the collodion went around it, so it didn't get light sensitive. But this is a hand wrought look. Uh, unknown photographer, Matthew Brady, Timothy O'Sullivan, you know, there's lots of names from the American Civil War. Everything shot on wet plate. This is a darkroom. Brady equipped a bunch of photographers, I don't know how many, but some number of photographers with wagons, and nobody knew what they were, these weird people out there with cameras and stuff. And he sent them out, and everything was credited to Matthew Brady because he was smart. But this is a what's-it wagon. Those people, that's what people would call it, is what is that? Oh, it's a what's-it wagon, you know, because they didn't know what it was. This is the darkroom, and then he's fiddling with something here. So it's going to look real familiar, so that's my what's-it wagon. In Denali, this is the darkroom. <laughs> it's a pelican case that opens up, and I have a little tent thing that goes around me. And there's a solar-powered safe light in there because collodion is not, uh, it's uh, orthochromatic. It's not sensitive to red light. So it's like paper if you've ever printed in a darkroom. So I can watch my negatives develop. But it has to be in a reasonable, ISO of one, by the way. So, and then here's my water, and, you know, I've got a back, in the back of the bus here, there's a, uh, and under this, Table, under the bed storage container is my darkroom sink. And then that's the, like the visible darkroom for doing fixing and stuff. So, I won't, uh, short history here, but Henry Jack William Henry Jackson, after the Civil War, and this is related to Denali, uh, after the Civil War, photographers were sent out west as part of the U.S. Geological Survey. They were trying to get settlers to go west. They are like, go shoot some sexy pictures of cactus so that people want to move here. And they dispersed. A lot of you've seen pictures your whole lives from that, hundred, that stuff over 100 years ago. And they were shooting, a lot of them were shooting wet plate, 
Henry Jackson went to Yellowstone and shot wet plate. This is him on the right. And here's the darkroom and a camera, and he's playing around with stuff. Uh, and that's been colorized, obviously, by Ted Turner, probably. Uh, so these were all taken in, Yosemite, uh, in Yellowstone. Now, Easterners who'd never been to Yellowstone heard these stories about hot springs and you know, prism pools and things. And it almost sounded fanciful, fantastical. So his photographs proved that Yellowstone was this amazing place. Congress decided we should start a national park system. And Yellowstone was the first one in 1872, largely in part because of uh, Henry Jackson's pictures, convincing them that this was a special place worth setting aside. Thus began the national park system. So when I went to Denali, and as far as I know, I'm the only photographer that's been in there with wet plate, at least I was at the time, it was kind of a touchstone to that park system starting. So here's, you don't have to read all this, but there's a lot of stuff you do. You're going to see it all in a minute. Here's a formula for collodion. Here's what my darkroom looks like these years. <laughs> you know, used to just have like fixer and developer, and now it's got chemicals all over the place, and I'm going to die one day. I had a bottle of ether that I lost track of that we call the bomb because I wouldn't touch it. Because ether, you can't contain ether. It gets out of anything. You can do whatever you want, but it's still going to get through because the molecules are so small. And after enough of it leaves, you've got essentially uh, nitroglycerin that can explode when you jar it. So I was always afraid of, I finally moved that can out very carefully the, about two weeks ago. But so you got a bunch of things. So here's, JR shot this, hopefully it'll play. Yes, it's just like two minutes. But this shows, he didn't shoot it into the park, he shot it afterwards. And uh, out at those painted rocks on the way to Ileson. But this, I'm going to narrate it. So this is my old 8x10, it's sitting out there, it's a, Deardor cameras call an 8x10 because the plate is 8x10 inches. That lens is a, a, a reissue of an old 1850s lens called Petzval. And some of the pictures you'll notice there's a big swirl in them. That's from the old lens. Your image upside on a, in a straight camera like this is upside down and backwards. This is me carefully being not careful. That's pouring a collodion, my favorite part of the process. You pour it on, you tip the plate carefully to get it in all the corners. And then that was a really messy pour. And there's a bucket catching my stuff under me. That's my little dark room. So now I'll take the salted collodion plate, which is wet. And in the dark room, I'm putting it in silver nitrate. You can do all that really in the light, but after it comes out of the silver nitrate, it has to be in the dark. Carrying the plate over to the camera to get ready for the exposure, which will be 15 seconds or more in broad daylight, wide open lens. It's an ISO 1. That's me looking very heroic. JR put all this in slow-mo, so makes it look like I'm just uh, Harrison Ford again. So there I am making sure I didn't do anything wrong and going back in the dark room. And then I'll, he doesn't have this, but I'll put developer. It develops within a minute, and I can see that. And then I pour water over it to stop the development. I can come out into the light and fix it. So this is a little out of order. But here's the plate right out of the developer, going into fixer. Fixer is what clears away the milkiness. And there, because it's against black, it looks like a positive in this image. If you put a wet plate negative against black, it will reverse. And that's the real hero shot. And here's the image. Thank you, JR. So here, uh, a few pictures of, of what this all, this mess looked like. So I took a lot of stuff down there. I took way too much stuff. Tell you a quick story. Kess Woodward, so the park has two ways in as a photographer. It used to only have one way. It's written into the charter of the park that they have to have a professional photography program. And the professional photography program in the park was people who were shooting for things like, you know, big national uh, magazines that use critters, landscapes, color. I'm about a million miles from that. I don't want to shoot a 600 millimeter lens of a bear. You know, but that's what that really, those are the people that get the park permit. Great. But if you want to go in with Collodion and shoot landscapes, there's no entry. And I complained to Kess when I found out he was on the board that selected the artist in residency program. So they didn't have photographers. So they said, photographers are covered. They got their own program. And I went, no, they don't. Not people like me, weirdos, you know. And so Kess took that to the board and they added photographers, by God. 
So after a couple of years, I decided I should apply, and, and they gave me the residency. However, I didn't know, really. I'd taken, I'd gone down and studied or learned wet plate from the master of the universe, Mark Osterman in Rochester, New York, about 2016. And then I applied for this, and I wrote I was going to do wet plate, like I'm this big wet plate photographer. And they gave me the residency, and then I'm like, jeez, what did I do that for? <laughs> you know, man, can I switch to digital? <laughs> you know, and um, so I took too much stuff. I was still really learning when I did all this. I remember going into the park with Lisa, my wife, the first day, and thinking, if I come out here with three photos in 10 days, I'm going to be thrilled. <laughs> But these are, this is a negative in the field and a negative. So here I am. And I got a show at the Anchorage Museum with this, which is another story altogether, but that was in the, the year after COVID. So this first picture I want to tell you because Lisa and I, I got so nervous. Residency was in July. In May, we went down and shot this. And I took the bus and I took everything in it because I had to go make a plate to see if it was really going to work for 10 days in the park. You know, can I go in with everything I need? And by the way, I took stuff in the park that they probably didn't want to know about. And no one ever asked me anything like, well, what are you doing with all that chemical waste <laughs> that you're generating? Hmm. It went in their outhouses. Um, it, but, you know, I think they just didn't want to know <laughs> what all I'm bringing is vile stuff. But we went out and made this plate, and it's a four by five, and I went home. And I let it dry in the car, thinking I'll wash it later, because I was still learning all this stuff. I go home and put it in a wash. I scanned it first. And I put it in a wash, and the emulsion just floated away. So there's a lesson. But this was the very first, OK, there's, there's a Savage Rock. I can do this. I can do this. So we go into the park. I'm hoping I can get three plates. And this is the very first day. There's a print of this out here, because I, I guess you can see it pretty well here. But this is up the very first morning we went up to Stony Dome. The, with the residency, they gave me a cabin, Toklat Ranger cabin, and we had that for 10 days in the middle of the park. My VW bus, I can drive anywhere I want for 10 days. Bill Gates can't buy that. I mean, that's an incredible thing that I'll cherish forever. Is that I don't know how to do it again. You know, I'm never, I'll never get back in there that way. But that's what comes with being an artist in residence at Denali, and you know. You know the deal in Denali, you just can't drive your car in there. So I had this awesome privilege. And people liked the bus, and they liked the camera, and you know, we got the wave over, and they'd stop and tell me where there was a wolf or a bear, like I cared, because I'm ISO 1 and a big camera. But they were really, it was great. It was a great experience. Had 10 days of sun. Went in there thinking, I hope this isn't the 10 days of sideways rain that I've been at in the park. And we just, we were in shorts and t-shirts, and the mountain was out almost all the time, and it's unbelievable, photo gods. So um, this is the first day, Stony Dome. I go up there, I, pull, I try to pull out of the way, because I can go anywhere, right? And that's where the buses turn around, and they back in there and let everybody look for Denali. And I'm over in the top left corner of the parking lot, and a bus driver comes over, because they don't know me yet. I have the artist in residency, uh, uh, magnetic signs on the bus. He's like, well, you can't really park there. And I said, well, what can I do? Well, pull up further. So I pull up like five feet, and they're happy. I get out, I get the 8x10, set it up, and I go make my plate. Well, they say that the weather is in every wet plate. And another thing about wet plate, you can't make two pictures alike. I'll show you that in a second. You make one picture, you think, oh, I could do this better, and you go make another one, they're 100% different. I mean, there's just, it's just vagary stuff. You invite chaos, well, here it comes with wet plate. Those little things that you see in here, is, as far as I know, is dust from the Stony Dome parking lot that got on my wet plate. So very dusty, the bus is coming and going. But it looks to me like an asteroid storm or a meteor storm. In fact, there was one weird, weird little flaw here where it looks like it's hitting the ground and blowing up. And that's the stuff digital wouldn't have given me, right? So this is the first day, first plate. Here's an example of two plates, one right after the other. First one, second one. Now, as far as I know, I didn't do anything different in between these two, but obviously I did. That's the picture I was taking in that shot of me with the bus. Okay, so here's the pictures, and there are a number of prints out there uh, that you can pick up and take a closer look at. Uh, this is uh, Teklanika River. Are you on a bridge or down the river? On the bridge with a 47 millimeter lens on it, so it's a very wide angle lens on a uh, little camera that I have that I stole from Paul Souders. Um, 
Normally, wet plate, it's, the, it's a blue sensitive, UV light sensitive image. And it's hard to get clouds. Back in the 1800s, they would shoot exposures just for clouds and they'd strip them in, sort of their version of Photoshop, 1885. But I tended to get some good skies and stuff. The, uh, the bridge now is being built between here and here. But luckily, you know, this year you wouldn't be driving where I did. Um, but that's the coming up to polychrome. I shot a, both 4x5 and 8x10 because uh, for one reason, I didn't have any real long lenses for 8x10. So if I wanted a, as much sort of a telephoto shot, I would put a 4x5 back on the camera. That's Marmot Rock. Yeah. Now let's talk about color for a second. This is all black and white. That's a black and white picture. But there's a chemical color to it. And this was a surprise to me, because you know, if you look at almost every wet plate picture in the world, it's going to be black and white. I started scanning them. And when you scan, these are all scanned and then printed digitally. I have printed some in the dark room, but you're limited to black and white contact prints. But I intended all along to scan these plates. And then um, if I were really brave, I'd just take a razor blade and scrape them and use them again like a digital card. But I don't do that with these. So I'm going to keep these plates. But I started getting this color, because you, you, when you scan, it's better to scan an, it's called an RGB file, red, green, blue file. It's better to scan in color than black and white. You have more fodder to work with. So I was scanning these in color and then flipping them, and I'm getting these colors. I'm like, what is that? So I take the plates and look at them, and you'll see the opposite color, like magenta in the sky here. And I don't know where it came from. Mark Osterman's not sure. Something to do with some of the water chemistry in the park that I was using. But you can see that chemical color on the plate. It tended to go brown in the foreground and blue in the skies. So I'm think at first they were going to flip them all to black and white and just, no, why? You know, this is what you like. This is the weirdness of photography that you've invited here. So some of them got real colorful, others just a little hint, others black and white. I couldn't control it, couldn't predict it. Exposure seemed to have something to do with it. If I screwed up exposure bad enough, I get more color. But um, this is out between. Uh, uh, like Wonder Lake and Kentishna. There's a wetlands there at the other end of Wonder Lake. But it looks like a forest fire. It's a beautiful sunny day, by the way. Of course, ISO 1, you're going to automatically get slow water. <laughs> and you see how poorly I'm pouring plates and all and loving it all along. Another Marmot Rock picture. So that's just a tinge of that kind of green and pink in the background. And there's where I remember very much, I was putting the plate in the uh, silver nitrate and I whacked it on the edge. There's a seam in it. That's the East Fork River from Polychrome, looking down. And that's a case of a 4x5 with a 450 lens for you guys in the know. So that's as long as I could get. Like, what does that compare to in 35 millimeter? That would be like three times, 150 millimeter lens on a 35 camera. So a short telly. There's a print of this out there. This is the, uh, you know, in some of these pictures for me, what would happen is the foreground, which is kind of like the collodion mess, and the background, which is the image, will kind of shift around with each other. And at first when I looked at this, I didn't see Denali, but it's obviously there. It's behind all these champagne bubbles. And if you look at these closely, they're like fractals, like bubbles lead into bigger bubbles. And they're just fascinating. When I was spotting them on the computer to get rid of dust, not dust, not like dust from the road, but stuff that's laid on the plate that I don't want to show up as a little white dot in them, I'd blow them up real big. So a little area of this would be just fill my whole computer screen. Just fascinating to see the, the weird chemistry that went on in a couple of minutes. It's called the Ghost of Wonder Lake. Because it's a long exposure, this is 45 seconds, and a load of tourists got out of a bus to go look at Wonder Lake. And I was already set up, so I just opened the shutter and left it. So some people are moving, some stood kind of still. One guy bent over and looked at the rock for a minute and stood up. Same rock. Tourists are gone, but now we got a bird right there. Oh, there's one of those islands like we saw in that earlier plate where I you know, didn't, it went around that spot on the plate. So Timothy uh, O'Sullivan's similar. There's outhouses at 
Toklat, a couple people that stood around. There's my VW camper. They're a little, no, not too bad, a little light on there. Uh, this is people looking for the mountain at Toklat again. So we just get up in the morning and go to the end of the driveway for their cabin and go, should we go right or left today? <laughs> so we're right in the middle. And then we just pick a direction and spend the day. Um, this is another view of Savage Rock. And that bat wing up above again, just bubbles. I couldn't make this, if, I mean, I, I don't know how to do this. It just happened. But that's that fractal thing again, small bubbles leading to bigger ones to bigger ones. That's the most Civil War looking picture to me with that arch top from the lens or something, probably where I pour badly, bad pour on the lens. So somebody asked me, how do you, and I was showing these to a group of students, how do you know when it's a bad one? Like, how do you, how do you gauge these? And I went, I don't know, because a bad one would probably be my favorite image, you know? I mean, it's kind of a weird reversal of the more accidents happen, or whatever you want to call it, more serendipity. Sally Mann calls it the angels of uncertainty. The more they reach in, the better, in a way, it becomes. I'd, I, got, I went into the park wanting to shoot this little creek. There's a little clear creek as you're approaching Isleson Visitor Center, just on the right there that comes down. So this is, this is the only vertical I shot, too, interestingly enough. So it became interesting, you know, what do I do with this in the show? Um, that's a completely black and white image. That is, I have not added color, enhanced color. What? Is it time? Um, we're a bit over time. So okay. I to do a Q &A session. Yeah, I'm almost on the last one. Okay. So a couple more quickly. That was a demonstration picture I didn't expect to like at um, Campton Alley. They gave us dinner. and. Uh, Ended up loving this picture. And again, it's like weird color stuff. Uh, demonstration antlers for tourists to pick up at Toklat. And this is that wetlands near where those spruce trees were shot out there near Wonder Lake. That's out there on the light table, if you want to look at the plate. And this is a, a diptych of Denali, my very last pictures from the whole thing coming out of the park. And Perfectly clear blue day for a digital photographer. I call it death to Ansel. <laughs> and that's this, this is the last image. Um, this is probably the singular Denali picture that I got that really, you know, that's the one I went in there to get, sort of, for me. Not somebody else's, but mine. And this one worked well. Does it just look like an ice cube in the hand singer? And that's it. Okay, Q&A. Any questions? Yes? Last photos. The blue is something that's not controlled by what you're taking a picture of? No. Or what's in the chemicals? Right. Uh, well, it's something to do with the chemicals. But uh, I don't know what. I asked Mark Osterman. He wasn't sure. Probably some reaction to whatever's in the water out there in the park and my chemistry. And so it's a chemical sheen you can think of it as. You can see it on the plate, but it has nothing to do with the fact there was a blue sky or not. It's the density of the film, and the texture of that area, and the way it's going a certain color. And, you know, photographers probably, if they don't know better, think I went in and added color. It would be very easy to do in Photoshop. In the old days, you could do it with oil paints on a print. Um, but I didn't. This is the way they came out. Now, at the very top, you see the intense blue. That's, I am moving the curve in Photoshop to bring in that exposure. So some of that color got darker because the curve is getting darker. But I'm not purposefully messing with color in these. Weird, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Especially oh. this one where there's the dark blue and the sort of turquoise blue. Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, my question is about these textures that are from the podium. Did, as you were figuring it out, did you ever feel like if you poured it a certain way or shook it a certain way, you could exercise some control over how they turned out? Remember, I didn't see these when I was out there in color. So this is all a surprise. I came back with this pile of plates. They were, they were dry plates. Put them in envelopes. There's an envelope out there like the ones I used. Labeled them every day. You know, I went through a ritual in the cabin at night to take care of the plates, get new glass clean. Cleaning glass is the worst part of shooting collodion. Um, so I didn't see any of this until I came home. 
So I don't, I don't know how you would purposefully do it. I've, I mean, I've shot a lot of collodion scents. Usually they come out black and white. Every now and then you'll get a tinge of color. But I mean, in terms of the textures and stuff too, like these fresh. Yeah, textures I could see some of about there, but only as far as the negative goes. So, and as as I mentioned, I wasn't really versed yet, and you know, I came out with a show. I went in hoping to get three pictures, but it was all just as a surprise to me as it was to, and so I was learning as I went. Uh, and now when I shoot it, I almost have gotten too good at it. I mean, sometimes the plates are too clean. And, and I think some of the novice part of the sloppiness here, sloppiness isn't a good word, but learning and the way collodion works, I've almost gotten beyond that, and, and that's irritating. <laughs> Do you have a dream location for <coughs> yeah. project? Yeah, I keep applying for the the Volcanoes Park residency in southern, in Hawaii. I would love to shoot Collodion there. I mean, all the lava and stuff. Yeah, you know, the trouble is traveling with it. And I mean, I tried to get on an airplane with that sheet film a couple of weeks ago, and that was a big enough deal. You can't, they'll arrest you if you carry ether onto an airplane and put you away. So you have to ship things and it gets complicated to move around. With the bus, I carried it through Canada and stuff, no problem. But uh, flying with collodion becomes a lot bigger issue. I'll wear, I'll wear you guys out. Yeah. Yeah, so collodion gets stickier when you make it light sensitive because at the moment when you pull it, it appears to be very liquid. Um, it's, does it's, it get stickier than through making it? Well, you want as thin a coat as possible on a plate. So uh, it's not a syrup. It's not that consistency, but it's not exactly water either. It's somewhere in that middle range. Um, does it run down the gas tank when you put it yeah. into the camera? So are the negatives thicker at the bottom? Yes. You get an edge. And, you know, you usually miss a corner. Um, where's the poor edge on one of these? You know, the, the corners that are missing are because you're pouring it around and you don't hit all the corners. Like I held, that's the top left corner when I'm pouring it, and the edge would have been that bottom area here. So this is a little bit of what you're talking about. So that would have been down where the pour came off. There's a little bit of a thicker. And it often goes blue. Even in tin types, it'll go blue. Like the bottom here, uh, that's probably different. But yeah, you do, essentially. Wherever it comes off. No. Yeah, the collodions, it's just like film. The collodions on the side toward the lens. Isn't it difficult to focus? Do you focus on the, on the glass screen of the camera and then the collodion is, of course, a little bit thicker? The holders are all set, so the collodion is exactly where the glass would be, just like with film. So that's not an issue if you're. And you know, one of the, you can be kind of a little bit loose. When we learned four by five, we was all technical and you know everything's got to be perfect and straight. And this, I was like, you saw me flipping the lens out there, I'm like, oh, let's see what happens, you know? Roll the dice. And so well, it wasn't. Was really, really tech shop. Yeah, some of them are amazingly good. That image with the of Denali with the asteroids and all is really super sharp. LJ. What is gun? No. gun cotton? I think it was a cotton used to stuff when they loaded powder. This I'm guessing, but they used cotton when they would put powder and shot, and then they'd stuff cotton down the barrel, right, to make it all explosive. I think that was gun cotton. It's probably just cotton. It's dissolved. Right, it's already in collodion. I buy collodion as a mixture, and there's already some ether in it, but then you salt it, you add ether, you add alcohol, and you salt it yourself. You can buy photo collodion and ready to go, though. And that is, that is shippable? That is not? You know, weirdly enough, with the university's chemical number, I've had collodion overnighted, uh, ether overnighted to Fairbanks. Think about that. I don't want to be on that plane. Yeah, what a world. Any other questions? Sorry I ran a little long, but thank you guys for sticking in. Thank you.